Good day everyone, I am Catherine Mauricio and I will be reporting the novel entitled To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee alongside Miss Coronado, Miss Bacal, and Miss Baldo. But before we officially start our discussion, let us first have the, ob the objectives which is to identify and examine the content, elements, themes, and symbols of the story, determine and analyze various issues such as social, moral, and economic issues present in the story, and to provide key facts or trivia about To Kill a Mockingbird. And our question to ponder, which will be answered later on at the end of our discussion, is to is what does the title To Kill a Mockingbird really means? And does it literally mean about killing a bird? Good day everyone, my name is Rena Baldo and I'm here to discuss to you the pre background of the author of the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. So, Lily Harper Lee was born on April 28, 1936 in at Alabama, U.S. Died at February 19, 2016 at the age of 89. Pen name was Harper Lee, occupation, novelist, nationality was American, studied at the University of Alabama, period 1960-2016, January was literature and fictions, literary movement was Southern Gothic, notable work was To Kill a Mockingbird and Go Set a Watchman. Good day everyone, so we will now move on to the characters of the novel. So the first character that we have is Scout Finch or Jean Louise Finch. So Finch is the narrator and the protagonist of the story. So he lives with her father Atticus and her brother Jem. So she is characterized as an intelligent and by the standard of her time and place, a tomboy. The scout has a combative streak uh, and a basic faith in the goodness of the people in her community. As the novel progresses, this faith is tested by the hatred and prejudice uh, that emerged during Tom Robinson's trial. So, Scout eventually develops a more grown-up perspective that enables her to appreciate human goodness without ignoring human evil. So, the second character is uh, Atticus Finch. So, Atticus Finch, uh, he is Scout and Jem's father and he is a lawyer in Maycomb. So, he is descended from an old, on an old local uh, family. So, he is characterized as a widower with a dry sense of humor. Atticus has instilled in his children a strong sense of morality and justice. So, he is one of the few residents of Maycomb committed to racial equality. When he agrees to defend uh, Tom Robinson, a black, ch a black man charged with raping a white woman, he, express, uh, he exposes himself and his family to the anger of the white community. With his strongly held uh, convictions, wisdom, and empathy, Atticus functions as the novel's uh, back, uh, moral backbone. The next character that we have is Jeremy Atticus Finch or known as Jem Finch in the novel. So, uh, Jem Finch is the older brother of Scout Finch. So, he is characterized as a typical American boy refusing to back down uh, from dares and fantasizing about playing football. So, he is four years older than a uh, Scout. So, he gradually separates himself from her games but he remains uh, her close companion and protector uh, all throughout the novel. So, Jem moves into adolescence during the story and his ideals are shaken badly by the evil and injustice that he perceives during the trial of Tom Robinson. So, the next character is Arthur Boo Radley. So, he, are, he is a class who never sets Put outside his house, so who dominates the imaginations of them, the scout, and Dill. So he is a powerful symbol of goodness, swath so in an initial uh, shrewd of creepiness, leaving little presence for Scout and Jem, and emerging at an opportune moment to save the children. So he is an intelligent child, emotionally damaged by his cruel. 
father. So, Book provides an example of the threat that evil possessed to innocence and goodness. So, he is one of the noble's mocking birds, a good person endured by the evil of mankind. So, this uh, fifth character is Bob Ewell. So, Bob Ewell is characterized as a drunken and mostly an employed member of Maycomb's poorest family. So, in his knowingly wrongful accusation that Tom Robinson raped his daughter, Ewell represents the dark side of the South. So, the ignorance, poverty, squalor, and hate-filled racial prejudice. And the sixth character that we have is Calpurnia. So, Calpurnia is the French black cook. So, she is the stern disciplinarian in the children's bridge between the white and black community. So, Calpurnia, so she is an African-American housekeeper. She grew up at Finch Landing and moved with Atticus to make home. She is the closest uh, thing to a mother that Scout and Jem have. So one of the few Negros in town who can read and write. So she teaches Scout to write also. And the, last, uh, the next character is Charles Baker Dale Harris. So she is commonly known as Dale. So Jem, she is a Jem and Scout summer neighbor and Friend. So, Dale is a diminutive, confident boy with an active imagination. He becomes fascinated with Boo Radley and represents the perspective of childhood innocence throughout the novel. Next, we have Aunt Alexandra, Atiko's sister. Aunt Alexandra lives at the Finch Landing, the family homestead. The fa Finch family homestead, but she moves in Atticus and the children during Tom's Robinson's trial. She is very concerned the scout have a feminine influence to emulate. Next, we have Mayela Violet Ewell, who is the daughter of Bob Ewell in 1960-1962 in a novel entitled To Kill a Mockingbird. Despite her not being the story main antagonist, she is regarded as the one of them due to claiming she was raped by Tom Robinson when instead she had likely been abused by her father, Tom's 19 years old accuser. Tom Robinson, the black man who was accused of raping and beating Mayela Ewell. Next is Nathan Radley, Boo Radley's brother, who come back to live with the family when Mr. Radley dies. Next we have Sheriff Tate, is a long, long, lifelong resident of my country. He first appears in chapter 10 in response to the call about the rabbit dog in Atticus Finch neighborhood. Dolphus Raywood Raymond, father to several Berishal children, Mr. Raymond lives on the outskirts of town. When she comes into my count, he pretends to be drunk. Lastly, we have Walter Cunningham, Senior, one of the men who comes to lynch Tom Robinson, is also one Atticus clients after seeking with Scout, he calls off the mom. So for chapter 1 summary, the novel begins with Scouts remembering the event that led to Jem, his brother, breaking his arm. She gives her family background by tracing that their family origin is from Simon Finch a fur trader from Cornwall and moves up to Alabama River and settled in Finch's Landing where her father Atticus and his two siblings were raised. Then she recounts back to the present in summertime where she plays with his brother but with boundaries. Their neighborhood was introduced here, including Radley's place. Radley has a son named Arthur or Boo, who attends a state school because of all the trouble he did. But Boo's father asked the judge to just place him under house arrest. But one day, Boo stabbed his father in the leg and the police came and placed him in a courtroom basement. Does it, that is back on house arrest only after Mr. Mr. Radley dies and her brother Nathan came back. Over the years, their story became exaggerated to the point that all the bad things that are happening is linked to Boo. Even if, even if just the plants dying, they are telling that it's because Boo breathed on it. And when Jem and Scout met Mr. Harris or Deal, 
he became interested in the stories and plans to lure Bu out of the house by starting a friendship with the two brothers. Chapter 2 started as September sets in. Jem is excited to start her first grade but her first day was not as good as expected. Her teacher, Miss Caroline Fisher, gets frustrated when she notices Jem is eager to learn reading and writing and thought that her father should not teach her because her father not knows how to. Being new, the teacher doesn't know how the social structure of the town and awkwardly confronts Walter Cunningham to buy him lunch because he didn't have any. But Walter said he doesn't have anything to pay back, and Scout explained that the Cunninghams doesn't take what they can pay back. Although she meant well, the teacher made her stand in the corner, in the corner, making her confused on what she thought was a helpful interruption. On chapter 3, Scout vents her frustrations on Walter at the playground for the earlier ordeal, but Jem stops her after realizing that Walter is the son of a man Atticus had defended in court. He invites Walter home for lunch, but he is at, but he is hesitant at first. He later joins Scout and Jem when they start walking away. At home, Scout asks Walter why he is pouring syrup in his food, but California calls her to the kitchen and scolds her for embarrassing him. She says he is just a cunning hump, and the cook sends her to the kitchen to eat alone. Next day, Scout stays behind as the others leave for school to convince Atticus to fire the cook for liking Jem more than her. But he says he has no intention of firing her and that Jem gives California less trouble compared to her. Back at school, Miss Caroline gets livid when she spots lies on student. Barris Ewell and asks him to go home and avoid infecting the others. Barris laughs her off and says he won't be coming back. An older student explains that the Ewells only attend school the first day to please the truant officer, but never come back. When the teacher asks Burris to sit down, he yells insult at her and drives her to tears. When Scout gets back home that evening, she is surprised by, by California's pleasantness. Atticus asks her to read with him after supper, but she says her teacher told her to stop, that she wanted to be like the Ewell kids and never go back to school. Atticus explains that the Ewells are, are a special case and everyone doesn't care about their lifestyle, that they even let their father, Bob Ewell, to hunt outside hunting seasons when everyone else lives by the law. They strike a deal with that she will continue going to school and they will keep reading together as they used to. In Chapter 4, it becomes clear that the intellect and curiosity of Scout are not suited for the rigid Maycomb school system. The school system demands conformity, just like the residents of Maycomb. Scout is naturally a free thinker. Hence, she feels oppressed and confined by the rigid school system. However, the author suggests that the kind of support she receives from Atticus, Calporn Calpornia, and Jem will be enough to help her cope with the challenges she is facing at school. The sudden and, un and unexpected arrival of gifts in the oak tree marks the beginning of mysterious occurrences in their lives. They are not sure whether the gifts are meant for them or not, but they do not really bother to ask themselves about the motive of the giver. Most of the chapter focuses on Dill's return to Maycomb, and, and his presence gives the readers an assurance that the story will focus more on his obsession luring Boo Radley out of the house. For the chapter 5 summary, Scout, Dill, and Jem are growing up a little. The boys prefer playing together without Scout's presence. This causes Scout to experience of some sort of an identity crisis and makes her feel at a crossroads. Throughout the book, other women including her aunt have always told her to act like a lady. Meanwhile, her brother, who is some kind of an idol to her, criticizes her for acting like a girl. Her conversations with Atticus, Calpurnia, and Modi Atkinson make her accept herself as she is. And through her discussions with Miss Modi and about Boo Radley, Scout begins to feel sympathy for Boo instead of fear. She will have this feeling throughout the rest of the book, and it will have a significant role to play by the end of the story. Miss Modi also becomes very important to Jem and Scout as a source of advice besides Atticus and California. 
For chapter 6, the author builds a foundation for what will become the main focus of the story, Atticus' participation in the Tom Robinson case. However, the most part of chapter 5 keeps the subplot of Boo Radley alive. It also reveals that Jem and Dill's plan to lure Boo Radley out of his house have become more daring to the extent that they plan to peek into the windows of the Radley house. The theme of race or racism is brought up in this chapter when Nathan Radley makes a hasty and misinformed assumption that the intruder at the Radley property is black. He acts swiftly and fires a shotgun at the intruder without even considering that he might be white or just kids having fun playing and running around. Another important aspect is Jem's determination to go back and retrieve his pants rather than letting Atticus know that he lied to him. Jem takes pride from the fact that Atticus and Calpurnia trust him with caring for Scout, and he doesn't want to lose their trust. This shows that he is already a thoughtful boy who is focused on his moral code. For the chapter 7, it introduces us to Jem's journey into puberty. Scout mentions that he is often moody, eats more food, and prefers to play with boys his own age. He even goes as far as showing Scout his newly sprouted chest hair. His emotional growth tends to go hand in hand with his physical growth. For instance, he decides to keep the information about the fact that Boo Radley might have been the one who mended his pants to himself. He uses his wit to nurture his belief that Boo Radley may be the one leaving them gifts in the oak tree. He gets upset when Nathan Radley cements the knothole because he feels like Nathan has, has destroyed Boo's method of communicating and interacting with the outside world. For Chapter 8, Jem and Scout are both beginning to view Boo Radley in a different way. They no longer see him as the monster of the neighborhood stories. They view him as a human being. The fact that they believe he is so lonely now makes them feel sad for him not scared. These modest words to the children are the reason why they now view someone who is very different from them as a good person. They still feel a little uneasy when Boo Radley is brought up, but they begin to see him as someone who should be protected, not feared. Their changing attitude towards Boo Radley indicates an openness which would provide more objectivity and fairness in Tom Robinson's case, where it practiced more widely in the community. And Scout is surprised by the way, by the way Miss Modi isn't bothered about her house which burnt down with her possession. But Miss Modi tells her that she was more worried about the fire hurting her neighbors than she was about her own her own possessions. Her kindness and selflessness is a show of strength that the Finch family will need later in the book. For chapter 9, Christmas at Finch's Landing was expected to be fun and enjoyable for Atticus and his children, but it turns out to be the exact opposite when Scout and Francis start fighting. The way Fra Francis criticizes Atticus for defending Tom Robinson represents exactly what most of the Macomb residents think. Situational irony is brought up in this chapter, when Atticus is more concerned about the safety of his children when some of the greatest criticism comes from his own family. Uncle Jack's treatment of, treatment of Scout right after the fight is also a significant aspect. If only he had taken the time to listen to her side of the story, he would have known that it was Francis who, in, who incited the fight with his hateful comments. Uncle Jack's unfair treatment of Scout and his unwillingness to hear her side of the story actually shows the kind of injustice that comes later in the story during the Tom Robinson trial. In Chapter 10, the, to the Tom Robinson case has made Atticus the talk of the town. Because of this, their perspective of their father changes. They now see him not only as a father, but also as a human being who has other roles to play apart from the ones he plays in the family circle. Maybe it is the criticism and anger directed toward Atticus by the people that make Scout to wish that her father was like other dads in the town, with the same hobbies such as hunting and fishing. Scout and Jem learn about their father's past from Miss Modi, and they realize that he is just like all the other dads in Macomb. However, Scout find her, 
finds her father's hobbies of reading and playing checkers more boring compared to the other dads who fish, hunt, and smoke. Their, their perspective about their father changes when Atticus kills a rabid dog with one shot. They realize they never knew this side of their father before and wonder why and wonder why that is so. He explains that shooting a gun well is not something to be proud of and should only be used when necessary. The fact that Sheriff Take trusted Atticus with his gun symbolizes the high esteem that the people of the town have for him. Jem and Scout learn a significant lesson on this on the importance of humility. In chapter eleven, this chapter introduces one nasty woman, Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose. Although always harasses Jem and Scout whenever they pass in front of her house, Jem is fed up with it that when she criticizes Atticus for supporting Robinson, he destroys her camellia bushes using Scout's baton. That evening, Atticus sends Jem to apologize to Dubose, and he, and he promises to tend to her bushes every Sunday. But Dubose asks him to come each day to read to her. For the next month, Scout accompanies Jem to Dubose's house. Even though she still made bad remarks about Atticus, he always read to her until she fell asleep. And after that month ended, she died. Jem revealed she had been battling her addiction to morphine, and her somber mood was a side effect of withdrawal. Atticus wanted the kids to see her strength and courage even though it ended a painful death. Next, Summer returns on Chapter 12, and Jem will be turning 12 soon. His adolescent traits are starting to show, depicted by him telling Scout to stop bothering him and start acting like a lady instead of girl, as he used to say. Neil writes to say he can't come and with it goes the hopes for a fun summer. He says that he has a new stepfather and that they were going to build a fishing boat together. He assures Scout he loves her and promises to come for her when he gets money. Atticus is called to an emergency session of the state legislature. In his absence, California takes the kids to a black church and they are received with a mixture of kindness and prejudice. The discrimination is an eye-opening experience, prompting, prompting them to discuss education, religion, and the differences between blacks and whites. When they get home, the sight of Aunt Alexandra wait, awaiting, them, awaiting for them catches them by surprise. For Chapter 10, 13, Aunt Alexandra takes the role of instilling good behavior on Jem and Scout to live up to the Finch family name. To please Alexandra, Atticus tells his, tells his children to behave accordingly as the good family name requires. They get confused and Scout begins to cry. He then tells them to forget everything he just said. In chapter 14, Aunt Alexandra tries to make the Finches live up to the standards she believes are right. Her reaction to Scout and Jem going to Calpurnia's church is in sharp constant contrast with Atticus's reaction. In their confrontation, a major difference is revealed between Atticus' philosophy of fostering bonds between people and Alexandra's philosophy of categorizing people and putting them into clusters. While the two adults argue, Jem and Scout slip away and discover that Dill has returned. Jem insists that they tell Atticus so he can inform Dill's parents and Aunt Rachel of his whereabouts. He stays with the Finches that night and as they talk with Scout, she realizes how much Dill is disconnected from his family. She appreciates her family bond with Atticus, Jem, and Calpurnia even more. The next week in Chapter 15, things seem better for Scout and Dill is staying for the summer. Jem agrees to assist them in repairing the treehouse. She is in good terms with her aunt and Dill has set another plan to lure out Boo. Sheriff Tate and a group of men including Dr. Reynolds, Reynolds and Mr. Avery come one day to inform Atticus that Robinson was being transferred to the county jail because it was dangerous for him to stay in the town jail a night before his trial. The reality of the case dawns on the family as James begins to worry about his father. The following evening, Atticus leaves for the town after supper and the three kids follow him sneakily. He comes out in front of the Maycomb jail as the kids watch from a distance. 
cars arrived and men empty out, looking for Robinson. The scout runs to Atticus and Jem, and Dill is forced to follow. A small struggle ensues, but Atticus refused to let them through. When Scout identifies Walter Cunningham's father, he tells him to say hello to his son, and her innocent request eases the tension as the men drive away. On Chapter 16, after the incident with the mob the, pre the previous night, the Finch home is very tense. Alexandra is upset the kids knocked out, while Atticus is glad they showed up. As the jury selection for the case begins, Atticus asks the kids to stay away from the courthouse that day. They are very curious because of the people passing their house to the courthouse. During the afternoon session, they stop to pick up Dill and head to the courthouse where they find seats in colored balcony. The trial begins at chapter 17. Sheriff Tate gives his testimony stating that Bob Ewell entered his office claiming his daughter Mayela had been raped and beaten by a black man. They went to the Ewells and she identified her attacker as Tom Robinson. When Atticus cross-examined him, he established that they didn't call a doctor and that the right side of Mayela's face received most of the beating, meaning this, the assailant was left-handed. Bob Ewell's story has gaping holes, but even though Atticus attempts to clearly lay bare all the gaps, the case boils down to race, the whites and the blacks. Bob Ewell is incapable of relating to anyone in a positive way. He is so fascinating and easy to hate because he represents the exact opposite of Atticus and his children. The saddest thing is that he infects the people around him with bitterness, especially his children such as Barry's Ewell, who is undoubtedly poised to be the Bob Ewell of the next generation, judging by the way he behaved toward Miss Caroline in Chapter 3. For Chapter 18, Atticus' cross-examination of Mayela clearly indicates that Tom Robinson couldn't have committed the crime. Mayela is defiant and even stops answering Atticus' question, questions towards the end because the evidence is in plain sight. But it still doesn't guarantee Tom Robinson's freedom. Atticus knows that the case can't be won, but the children show some kind of childlike hope that based on the evidence, Tom cannot be convicted. However, there is a feeling that Tom is going to be found guilty. In Chapter 19, Tom's testimony reveals him as a gentle and caring man who occasionally helped his neighbors, the Ewells. He states that Mayala had been inviting him over the fence to perform small tasks for her, and she always made sexual advances at him. On the day in question, he assisted her and she, and she kissed him, but when her father saw it, he fled. Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination doesn't change Tom's testimony. He is asked why he would do all that work without getting paid and he responds that he feels sorry for Mayela, a statement that insults the Ewells. Dill suddenly begins crying and Jem tells Scout to take him outside to the square where he reveals that Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination on Tom was what upset him. In chapter 20, in the square, the two talk with Dolphus Raymond who has a black girlfriend and children of mixed race, something looked down upon by many in Maycomb. He offers Gil Coca-Cola, which Scout thinks is alcohol. Surprise, she asks Raymond why he lets people think he's a drunkard, and he answers that the people would leave him and his family alone if they think he's a drunkard. The children return to the courtroom and Gil gets Scout and Jeb's attention as he points at California as she walks towards Atticus. For Chapter 21, Calpurnia passes a note informing Atticus that his children are missing from the house, but the newspaper publisher Braxton Underwood tells him that the children are in the colored balcony. They meet downstairs and Atticus orders them to go back home. Alexandra is shocked to learn where they had gone to. After eating, they get back, and the jury arrives with a verdict at around 11 p.m. The guilty verdict is read. And after changing a few words with Mr. Gilmer, he packs his briefcase and leaves to a standing ovation from everyone in the colored balcony, including Reverend Silses. In Chapter 22, this chapter focuses on what, the, on what the characters take away from the trial and how it might change them in the future. Aunt Alexandra shows how she loves Atticus 
and her children when she waits for them to come back, just like Barry's Ewell. Alexandra's prejudices are a, res are a result of her surroundings. Her glimpses of care are very rare, but they suggest she might change. Jem feels betrayed by Maycomb when the guilty verdict is read. The reactions of Atticus to the trial are informative because even though Alexandra is mad at him for letting the children go to the courtroom, he insists that it is important for her children to understand the makeup of their community. Next, in Chapter 23, Jem, Scout, Deal, and Alexandra are all worried about Atticus after the ordeal with Mr. Ewell, but he reassures them that all is well. They all look forward to Tom Robinson's appeal which Atticus is confident they have a good chance of winning. When Atticus states that he allowed a relative of Walter Cunningham's to serve on the jury, Scout remembers Walter and promises to invite him for lunch again when school reopens. But Alexandra forbids her from playing with Walter because he is trash and can impart bad, happen bad habits in her. Scout is upset about what her aunt says about Walter as James says that he is starting to understand why Boo prefers to remain indoors. For chapter 24, with summer nearing its end and Dill about to leave, he and Jem go to Baker's Eddy where Jem teaches him to swim. Alexandra invited old missionary friends over, but Scout is uncomfortable around them and prefers to be with Calpurnia making refreshments. Atticus suddenly arrives and pulls Alexandra aside to inform her that Tom Robinson had been shot while attempting to escape from prison. Atticus in California leaves to go and inform Tom's wife, of, Tom's wife about the bad news. Alexandra wonders how much more the town will throw at Atticus, but Miss Modi tells her that the people's trust in Atticus is a tribute to him. In Chapter 25, the assertion that Tom showed his true colors when he tried to escape speaks again to the racist stereotypes that propose that all black people are dishonest and untrustworthy. It's far more likely that Tom didn't see any other avenues to escape from his horrible, unfair circumstances and was broken mentally, something entirely understandable in his situation. That Maycomb is so interested in Tom's death shows again how little the town thinks of its black residents. In Chapter 26, school starts and Jem and Scout again begin to pass by the Radley place every day. They are now too old to be frightened by the house, but Scout still wistfully wishes to see Boo, Boo Radley just once. Meanwhile, the shadow of the trial still, hang, still hangs over her. One day in school, her third grade teacher, Miss Gates, lectures the class on the wickedness of Hitler's Hitler's persecution of the Jews and on the virtues of equality and democracy. Scout listens and later asks Jem how Miss Gates can preach about equality when she came out of the cor courthouse after the trial and told Miss Stephanie Crawford that, we that it was about time that someone taught the blacks in town a lesson. Jem becomes more furious and tells Scout never to mention the trial to him again. Scout, upset, goes to Atticus for comfort. In Chapter 27, references to Bob Ewell haunt Scout even though she says life is setting back to normal. The tension begins to build as she relates to Bob Ewell's run-ins with other people, and it is evidence that further misdeeds by Bob are still on the way. This chapter provides more information about Bob Ewell and he begins to appear as an evil person. In Chapter 28, this it has a lot of action and mystery, and with Jem's arm shattered, we come full circle to Scout's reference to his broken arm in Chapter 1. The band between Scout and Jem is evident here, despite their age and gender differences. The man who helps the children seems to be Boo Radley, and the revelation of Bob Ewell's death acts as tense lead-ins to Scout meeting Boo face to face. Just like Tom Robinson's mangled arm and Boo Radley's reclusive nature, Jem's shattered arm symbolizes the Mockingbird, an innocent, vulnerable creature, but they prove that despite the fact that they could be wounded, they are not completely broken. In Chapter 29, Scout meets Boo Radley at last. Like the trial scene, it is simple in plot and dialogue but loaded in, but loaded in sensory detail. Their interaction is touching 
but not sentimental, clearly consistent with Scout's entire narration. In chapter 30, the doctor tells everyone to leave the room for him and Jem, and though anxious, Scout guides Blue to the porch where the discussion continues. Atticus tries to defend his son, claiming he killed Ewell in self-defense, while Tate says multiple times that Jem did not kill Ewell, that he fell on his knife. Atticus insists on his side of the story, but after some time, he realizes what the sheriff was trying to do. He was covering up for Boo by stating that Ewell fell, fell on his own knife. He states that his deci decision as the sheriff of the, of the Maycomb County was final. Then lastly, in chapter 31, Scout shows a level of maturity beyond her age as she walks home with Boo and shows him how to position his arm to properly escort a woman. She tries to give him dignity even in front of the eyes of the neighbors who might be watching. She understands Boo's viewpoint as he sees them as not just neighborhood kids but as his kids. In this, la in this last chapter, Lee refers once more to the idea of walking in another person's shoes. The main topics in the story, equality, class, prejudice, racism, and morality pass a strong message that links all the themes throughout the narration. So, for our critical analysis, let's first have the publication. On July 11, 1960, the novel To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee was published. Because of its enormously popular, it was translated in, into some 40 languages and sold more than 30 million copies worldwide. So for the awards, a year after its publication, To Kill a Mockingbird won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The Pulitzer represents distinguished fiction written by an American author. It does not only represent the most famous but also the most illustrious award for literature to many. The second award is Best Sellers Magazine and the uh, Brotherhood Award. So in 1961, the book received the Brotherhood Award of the National Conference of Christians and Jesus, a group founded in 1927 renamed in the 1990s as the National Conference for Community and Justice dedicated to promoting religious, racial, gender, and social equality and diversity. Bestsellers Magazine also opted to award Lee's novel bestowing its Paperback of the Year Award in 1962. The next award is the Presidential Award President George Bush bestowed the Presidential Medal of Freedom upon Lee for her novel in 2007, citing the influence of the novel on American culture as part of his reasoning. As for the theme of the novel, let's have first the prejudice. Prejudice is displayed by several characters throughout the duration of the novel. Harper Lee shows the theme of prejudice through Tom Robinson's trial, wherein it is evident throughout the novel that the trial is a formality only and that Tom Robinson will be still found guilty. Also, Atticus words reveal that the courts were always biased against black people. No matter how much evidence proved their innocence, if they had been accused of a crime by a white person, they would always be found guilty. Another scene is during Aunt Alexandra's missionary tea. The white middle class ladies discuss the awful living conditions of the women and children of the Emrina tribe in Africa. However, they are far less sympathetic to the black people living in Maycomb. The use of the word darky shows the lack of respect these women have towards the black community. They are not worried about the feelings of the black people who work for them or why they might be unhappy only that they themselves find it irritating. This shows how prejudiced some of the white women are. The next theme is courage. Courage is displayed by several characters in the novel. The author shows the theme courage through Atticus defending Tom Robinson. 
Atticus knows he must defend Tom Robinson. He feels he could never be proud of himself again or expect Jem and Scout to trust him again if he did not defend Tom. He also knows that many lawyers in, uh, in the country neglect Tom's case as they would automatically assume he was guilty. Here, um, Atticus is telling Scout that if he loved to courage to defend Tom Robinson in his trial, then he would not be a very good lawyer or a very good father. He is being courageous in defending Tom and he wants Jem and Scout to understand how important it is that he do the right thing. The next theme is the conflict between good and evil. The writer deals with the idea of good and evil by highlighting uh, the transition of Jem and Scout from the perspective of innocence. They believe that people are good because they do not realize the evil side of human nature. However, their viewpoint is changed when they learn that evil, once unleashed, refuses to be bottled up. This leads to the destruction and emotional death of people like Boo Radley and Tom Robinson. This theme uh, uses deep in the novel as Atticus acknowledges that the, this um, goodness in, there, there are some goodness in bad people. The next theme is education. It is not only evident but uh, also very pervasive despite the fact that the educational system in Maycomb leaves much to be desired. Atticus instills love and benefit of good education in Jem and Scout. He nurtures the element of uh, positivity in their minds so strongly that no evil can uproot it. Atticus also takes pride in instilling the roots of moral education in his children. He not only treats them as an adult, but also encourages them to grow intellectually and morally. So for the purpose of this, um, the author's purpose to write the, uh, in writing this novel is to explore the concepts of social inequality, to show her audience moral values, the difference of right versus wrong. She also um, does this to, uh, very effectively by making Scout the main uh, girl in the story and Jem, her brother, seemingly innocent because they have not seen evil this early in their lives. There are a lot of symbols found in the novel. The first one is the Mockingbird. The Mockingbird represents the idea of innocence. Thus, the title To Kill a Mockingbird is To Destroy Innocence. Throughout the book, a number of characters can be identified as mockingbirds, innocents who have been injured or destroyed through contact with evil. The next symbol is the Radley Place. Boo Radley and his mysterious house are Maycomb legend. For the people of Maycomb, the Radley place serves as a stand-in for the fears of the unknown. Even scarier than the Radley place is Boo Radley, the malevolent phantom. Boo becomes a figure of superstition, a convenient excuse for the problems of Maycomb. And the last uh, symbol is flowers. Many of the flowers in To Kill a Mockingbird are actually symbols. Camellias, azaleas, and geraniums. Uh, Mrs. Du Bois, camellias symbolize the prejudices which cannot be read of easily. They have to be tugged by their roots. Azaleas grown by Miss Maudi are known for growing in adverse conditions shade and barren or acid soil just as Miss Maudie always has a bright personality despite the bitterness and prejudice around her in Maycomb. Geraniums are grown by Miss Mayela and are a poor person's substitutes for roses.
Though, though they smell of cuts, they nevertheless represent my jealous cleanliness and unfulfilled love. The love that never comes her way and which she tries to force from Tom Robinson. In addition, I have here some facts or trivia about the novel and about the author. The first one, did you know that the book was almost called Atticus? A nod to the noble-minded and kind Atticus Finch, who plays such a pivotal role in the story. However, Lee decided against it, fearing it would make the book seem to be focused on just one character. Next is, uh, Lee's full name was actually Nell Harper Lee. Her first name was the backward spelling of Ellen, her grandmother's name, and was pronounced as Nell rather than Nellie. So the reason why she published his or uh, she published her um, novels under the pen name Harper Lee is because she didn't want her readers to mispronounce her first name. And the third and last uh, trivia that I can give you for today is Atticus Finch, the character Atticus Finch, was inspired by Lee's father. Uh, Lee based the beloved Patty York on her own father named A.C. Lee, who worked as a lawyer and once defended two African-American men accused of murder. Although he lost the case, the lessons he imparted to his daughter clearly left their mark. So, that is the critical analysis of the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. So we will now proceed on the connection of the novel in our society. So I've so I've got four main points that I will share to you on what on what is its importance uh, for us. So first we have social inequality. Differences in social status are explored largely through the overcomplicated social hierarchy of become, the ins and outs of which constantly baffle the children. These rigid social divisions uh, that make up so much of the adult world are revealed in the book to both irrational and destructive. Example of this social inequality in the novel is when Aunt Alexandria, who appears quite comically obsessed with family heritage and tries to prevent her nephew and niece uh, from mixing with uh, who she regards as unsuitable people, whether black servants like Calpurnia or poor white like the Cunninghams. People who are seen to be odd like the reclusive Boo Radley are also discrim discriminated against. So, like what uh, Aunt Alexandria did, uh, this can also be observed in our society. That if you are uh, rich or belong in the high class society, you should also socialize with high class people as well as the middle and the low class. So, people on the high profile also has the more power than the lower one which is seen in the novel when Tom Robinson, a black man who is also belong in the low class, was persecuted after being accused in the case of rape by a middle or somehow high class proper uh, white man. So he was not able to claim the justice for himself, uh, which is actually also seen now in our society that mostly, or if you are poor, there is a small or no chance for you to uh, win a case in the court or achieve the justice that you want. And so the second main point that we have is racism. So racism is actually the heart of the novel to kill a mockingbird. Conflicts of racism drive some of the most compelling and memorable scenes in the novel. Example of this is the consternation of Makeham's racist white community. Atticus agrees to defend a black man named Tom Robinson who has been accused of raping a white woman. So the example that I actually relate to this is the issue about the death of uh, a black man named George Floyd into the hands of a uh, poli uh, white police white American police officer. So racism is uh, actually not only viewed in that case. So 
as I observe here in the Philippines, so racism can be uh, seen in terms of uh, when you have the skin color of black, people will actually uh, see you as an as an ugly person. But if you have uh, the skin color of white, uh, they will uh, view you as a beautiful person. And other uh, issue is uh, that if you have the skin color of black, mostly you are prone to a uh, bullies. So that is an example for me that i can relate to racism here in our society so the third uh, point is injustice so injustice uh it can be seen in the death or persecution of the african american uh tom robinson after being accused that he raped a white woman so if we are still familiar on what happened on the mother and son uh, gregorio who was killed by the police by a police officer without a strong evidence or reason to shot those uh, two peoples which lead to their death as well as the death of some accused drug uh, pushers who are shot by police but according to the relatives those people are innocent so we can relate it to what happened on tom robinson wherein he was persecuted after being accused that he raped the daughter of bob evil so uh, they don't actually have enough evidence that tom robinson did the accusation but still uh this uh they sent him to persecution that leads to his death also and lastly moral issues so this was seen in the novel when mr atticus finch a white lawyer take the side of the black man tom Rob tom robinson to defend him about the uh, accusation even if this actually leads to the abuse of his children so the honesty of mr finch or the fairness that he shows is the one that the noble wants to uh tell us that no matter what we should always stand on the right things and not on the preferred standard of the society this attitude of him actually became the good example for the moral bar values for his children which is actually good since as a parent we are the one who should be the first uh, example to them to show justice and equality so in the present time uh, these four uh, points that I gave you is actually can still observe and seen in our society. Maybe it uh, in the school, work, or even at home. Having this kind of novel uh, or literature will help us to be aware and opens up our mind that we should make a move to address this kind of problems. This also tells us that we should treat each other uh, equally because everyone in our society is important and has the right and freedom to live for themselves. Always stand on what is good and right, be fair, respect each other's existence, and love each other. Now, before we officially conclude our discussion, let us answer first our question to ponder given earlier. And our answer would be, the title of To Kill a Mockingbird has very little literal connection to the plot, but it carries a great deal of symbolic weight in the book. In this story of innocence destroyed by evil, the mockingbird comes to represent the idea of innocence. Thus, to kill a mockingbird is to destroy innocence. Harper Lee notably tells that it is a sin to kill a mockingbird, alluding to the fact that the birds are innocent and harmless. And that is all and thank you.